As many of you already know, I'm making my own operating system. If you don't know, go ahead and click on this video here. Anyways, I wanted to show you a few stuff I had already made but didn't have the time to show you previously. Something a lot of you were mad about was how I skipped this category on the first video. If you insist, I'm here to explain it as interestingly as I can. Something many of you don't know is that our CPUs can only handle doing one thing at a time. This brings several issues like what if an error happens on our current execution. The solution posed by the x86 architecture was interrupts. They stop the CPU from whatever it is currently doing and force it to handle the issue. Here is an example where I try to divide by zero. The system crashed. This is where interrupt handlers come in. They decide what the behavior for said errors should be. For a regular process, it would kill the process and for the kernel, it would present a kernel panic. What about when we move our mouse? It needs to stop the execution of the processor without crashing the system or current process. Here comes the IRQ. It includes some interrupts that can be handled peacefully. Those revolve around most common hardware. Another topic I skipped without explaining because of its complexity is multitasking. I'll try to simplify it as much as I can. Remember how I told you that the CPU can only handle one thing at a time? Well, the only logical question now is how can we run a lot of programs simultaneously? We can't. Reality is, what you're seeing right now is fake. It's just an illusion created by what we call a scheduler. The scheduler's job is to switch between programs so quickly that the user cannot notice. And because computers are so fast, it does work. Another x86 specific thing is PCI. Those who have built their own PC have noticed what we call PCI slots. Don't confuse PCI devices with these slots, even though they might be connected in some way. PCI devices are different devices for multiple purposes. Those can be GPUs, microprocessors, sound cards, network cards, and many more. They are not required to be plugged into PCIe slots, and can even be embedded into the motherboard. This is the case with, let's say, sound cards. Back on my days, they used to be sold separately. Now they just come soldered in most motherboards. What I just described was the PCI protocol. Devices like these are forced to follow the PCI standard, which operating systems can then use to interact with them in a documented way. This is at least in theory. In practice, things are much, much different. Scanning for devices was quite simple, and I made a fully working kernel level API around it. With that, I was ready to start implementing stuff for specific devices. One such device is the infamous NE2K, or other words, NE2000. It's an extremely simple network interface made in 1987. Yeah, very recent, I know. As a test, I managed to initiate it and get back an actual MAC address that matched the actual address of the virtual machine. I guess that's one step towards a network stack, isn't it? It's essential to have a way of tracking time on your operating system. Since I obviously don't have networking yet, I can only use the good old BIOS time. I'm not the biggest fan of this approach, but it works, and later on I can implement an actual network layer in front of it for, let's say, NTP synchronization. Something I am quite strict of is bare metal compatibility. The whole purpose of an OS is to run directly on hardware without any compatibility layer like virtualization software. 
Relying on such stuff defeats the bare purpose of an operating system and is honestly very unfun. One reason I can't simulate this is because my laptop only supports AHCI drives and I've not written an AHCI driver yet, only an IDE one. Everything else I've tested on my laptop works fine without any issues.